I'm going to give you a, a rough outline of suggested timings because we've got quite a packed agenda tonight. So it is your meeting and, and, and we can take any item for longer or shorter than you like, but I just want to give an indication so we get everything so that we get everything in tonight. So we, we begin with the open forum. So I'm suggesting about 20 minutes, but, but uh, of course that's subject to, to what you all think. Um, we then have the uh, we then have the uh, CCG Merton Healthy Care Plan. So I'm suggesting about 20 minutes for that. We then have the leader of the council who, who, who visits us at least once a year and, and, and tells us about his in-tray and, and the major uh, issues that he's working on. So I assume about two minutes for that now. I'm joking. I assume <laughs> half an hour. I assume half an hour uh, for that. Um, and then and then the Wimbledon Master Plan will be joined by Paul McGarry, the head of Future Merton. And I've assumed 45 minutes for that. So it is your meeting. You can change any of those things, but that's just to, to give you an indication. So I, I said uh, at the beginning that, as I always say, that the, um, that the purpose of this evening is for you to uh, share your ideas, policy ideas or concerns with your elected representatives. So can I just ask, uh, and I think you're quite cute tonight, can I ask, and please keep it as quick as you can so we can kick off, the councillors in the room, um, just to stand up briefly and introduce yourself and just say which ward you're from. Um, the Wimbledon, the Wimbledon councillors. If you could just stand up very briefly and uh, say hello and introduce yourselves. Well, hi, I'm Dan Holden. I represent the Hillside Ward and also deputy leader of the Conservatives. I'm Ed Gretton, Councillor Ed Gretton, Park, for example, of May, and uh, responsible for the Conservative Party for matters of studying education and young people across the borough. I'm Paul Cole of the Trinity Ward. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, so let's begin with open uh, forum. Uh, we've had two people indicate uh, that they want to speak. It is only 20 minutes, so if both speakers who've indicated they'd like to speak, if they could be as, quickly, as quick as possible, uh, within reason, and I will be very mean tonight and guillotine you, because, uh, because it is important to get through the agenda. Some meetings uh, uh, have less, but tonight we do have quite a lot on. So Ingrid, would you like to go first? Yes. Do you want me to stand up? Yes, please do, yeah. Okay, I run the Bioelectronic Research Initiative, and I have asked the council several times about the future plans with Acriva uh, and their, their, their Wi-Fi network, uh, because Acriva is actually publicly stated that they will, that they will install 5G antennas in that house. That's on public record. But I don't seem to get any, any proper answers from the council as to when and if they do that, although I know that they are updating their wireless network. Now, I have here in front of me a, <coughs> a petition of 220 scientists worldwide. And anybody can look at that on EMF Alliance and my website, they will look. Um, this is a really undersigned, more than 220 EMF Alliance, 220 scientists and doctors from 35 countries recommend the memoratorium on the rollout of the fifth generation 5G for telecommunication and potential hazard for human health and the environment have been fully investigated by scientists uh, independent from industry. 5G will substantially increase exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic fields on top of 2G, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, etc. For, telecommuni for telecommunications already in place, RFEMF has been proven to be harmful to humans and the environment. Now, 5G leads to a massive increase of monetary exposure to virus radiation. I just want to give an example. Uh, presently, about 11 meters from a mass, from a lunar mass, <coughs> we have the allowance is 61 volts per meter. That is, you can only stay in that area for seven minutes. Now with 5G, it will be 120 watts per minute. And everybody will be exposed to 61 watts per minute. Because every 100 meters in, in lampposts, you will have 
the 5G network. Uh, it is very important that it is looked at before the rollout. There is no, there has been no research done on this, no health research done on this. I've, um, you know, I've, I've written to my MP asking him to, uh, to ask Public Health England, but nothing. Now, 300, it's, it's been rolled out in America, 300 mayors of American cities have, have uh, threatened to sue the FCC if they insist on the 5G rollout. I've just got a letter from my friend in Jacksonville, Florida, who told me that they 5, they now, 5G is now in, employed, deployed in Jacksonville and everybody is sweating like mad because it's causing sweating. It's called the, the, uh, everybody can look at this uh, scientist appeal on either my website or on EMF Alliance, and we are part of EMF Alliance, International Alliance Against EMFs. Yeah. It's very important that I get proper answers from Merton, which I don't seem to get. Either they don't know about it, or they're not asking the right questions and giving me the right answers. Okay, Ingrid, okay. thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, just so Ingrid, Chris actually does have an answer for you because you were you were good enough to give us notice of what you wanted to say. So thank you for that, and that's meant that Chris has been able to do some digging around for you. So the, the latest I have is that uh, they're trying to arrange a meeting with the company. I'm sorry, I've forgotten their name, but the company you mentioned to try and get an idea of what the schedule and what they're planning to do and when they're planning to do it. But as far as we're aware, we're not we don't have any powers to stop them with the progress in the same way we did with previous rollouts. So it, we can find out the schedule of what's happening and when, but we're not aware of any powers that individual authorities have to, to prevent it from happening. So in other words, if you, even if you know that there are health effects from all these scientists, you can't do anything about it? At the moment, that's our understanding, yeah. That's how it's got a for that. Apparently it's a national scheme, so no. Because it, it, it's not a new structure, it's embedded within the existing network. So the science and the technical bit is well beyond my understanding or knowledge. That was the advice I If you given. don't understand it, you shouldn't do it. Isn't that what they said? Mm -hmm. oh, well, I'm not doing it, but um, there's a good reason why I'm not charging that. Uh, but it, so I, I don't understand that bit. But the advice I got was that we're not aware of any powers we'd have to block it. Will the council undertake to do more than speak to the people that are wanting to roll it out and try and get some independent views on it? So that, so thank you for that, and that view will be fed back by Chris into the process. Okay, any other comments? So we'll keep you posted. Thank you, Ingrid, for bringing that up. Um, Peter? Thank you. Uh, I just given everyone a flyer on the school which is proposed in the South of uh, My reason for being strongly about this is if this goes ahead, I think this will be a crime against the 350 young children in the Navi Primary School, which is identified by the Mayor's report published this year, May, as one of the most polluted school sites in the whole of London, and uh, also for the 1,100 children who are going to go to this five-storey air-sealed air school um, on, the, on that site. Um, I really am quite alarmed that the council can still be going ahead with this. Some of you may have read the Guardian. <coughs> Guardian. Um, the Harris Federation said, um, the Harris Academy, who are planning the school, says there's nothing to worry about. As part of the planning process, we had an independent analysis of air quality on the site commission. This has raised no concerns about the site. Amazing they didn't actually find the Mayor of London's report on this site um, of any concern at all. Of course, it was an air quality commission by their own people. So on page 27, there are proposals for a new school directly east of the primary school. This will replace the existing community centre. The head teacher is very concerned about the impact that the additional school on the high park will have on the transport network and air quality. Um, the new secondary school demolition and construction work <coughs> will result in increased traffic and therefore increased emissions. Page 30. P pupils are exposed to polluted streets while walking to and from the school. Page 36. 
Then, to add insult to injury, Merton Council produced their own air quality report on May this year. And in that report, it says that um, um, in 2017, we provided an air quality information day at Merton Abbey School, where pollution levels are amongst the highest in the borough. So we've basically got a system where the Planning Committee of Merton Council and Stephen Allen Britis here, the leader of the council, are going to press ahead with the construction of a secondary school. What is worse, not only are the pollution level now dangerously high, according to the Mayor and Merton Council, but because the high Park Estate is going to be doubled in density, doubling the car parking spaces and the number of bedrooms, it, the pollution levels will increase. When I spoke at a meeting the other week, a councillor said, don't worry, we can plant a few trees. <laughs> This is probably the same kind of people who were saying there's no need to worry about the air quality. It's quite, uh, probably, I've only got grandchildren and they're not going to school in Merton, but my son went to school in Merton. I would not send a child of mine to that primary school now and I certainly wouldn't send them in the future. And if you agree with that, I would ask you to really press the Mayor of London, the Chairman of the Planning Committee, this man here, who I don't think has read the Mayor's report, to stop this scheme. There's plenty of other sites. Merton's got more open space than any other London borough. We've only got a month to stop this. If it goes ahead, children in the Mayor's own leaflet are dying in London because of air pollution. If this goes ahead, it's a crime. Peter. Uh, so Peter has given a, a proposal and a request that, uh, that uh, people who uh, feel strongly about what he said that you lobby uh, in the way that he said. Uh, that being said, uh, given that Peter has already given a recommendation, is there anybody who has a, a really pressing desire to comment further? I would just like to make one observation. This is an open forum and I'm shocked that Mr Adam Wright has turned his back on Mr Walker. I've had my issues with Mr Walker, Mr. Walker in the past myself, but I think that was highly rude and inappropriate at what is meant to be an open forum. Okay, what I would say, thank you for that, what I would say is that is that so far in the time that I've been chair of this uh, committee, uh, although that didn't help me, Stephen, uh, because I was about to say, uh, we have avoided personal attacks, and, uh, and I would like to, as far as possible, yeah, always make sure we do. Back no, I agree, I, I agree, it wasn't helpful for Stephen to do that. Okay, any other comments? Yes, at the back. I just have three short comments. Uh, having attended Merton Abbey School four years ago, I remember. Um, one thing about the land grab, which perhaps is pretty good out across the bar, uh, they're saying that there's too much space around Merton Abbey for primary school children, therefore the secondary can have a bit of it. Shouldn't it be celebrated that our youngest children have large amounts of space with mature trees in which to run about with and generally enjoy themselves? Do all this exercise is supposed to be getting them out of this obesity crisis that they leave themselves into? Secondly, it was said even before the planning commission was mooted by Harris that it was a challenging site. Um, the challenges that still appear to be ones of air quality, access and other things. I'll just correct these up. The number of car parking spaces on High Park is going to be halved, so there's going to be more people, but we're all going to be walking around there, bumping into 700 kids going the other way. And it was admitted to me by the uh, leader, or by, by the previous spokesperson on the council for children and young people of education, that the site was not the best site. Uh, it was it's basically what they thought they could afford to get away with it. Uh, they didn't bother to look at some places that would be slightly better, that may actually involve digging into their pockets a little bit more to buy out alternative things that maybe look closer to the, to the playing fields, which this school does not have, and doesn't have a guarantee of having any perpetuity, uh, amongst other things. So, you know, no accounts for typically like that. 
Okay, thank you. Time for literally one or two more questions, comments? Um, just a comment. The um, application, the planning application has loaded some more documents, and in the last one, it shows that the construction uh, operation and the site where they're going to place their heavy vehicles and the entrance to building this Harris School is right on the edge of the remaining green space of Merton Adams School. So not only are they losing a part of their green in order to give it to Harris to turn it into a multi-use games area, which the children in Merton Abbey would only get three hours per week use of it, they are also placing the construction area with the entrance to the vehicles right on the edge of Merton Abbey, which the mayor has said is one of the most green -like schools in, in London. I don't know how or <coughs> what Mr. Alan Britis is thinking, but he has tweeted that the school is imminent, so I would like to also be assured that the planning meeting with the majority of Labour councillors there will be fair and just and not be a predetermination. Thank you. Okay, further, yes, madam. Um, and also, regarding Merton Hall, that people were asked to make bid school for Merton Hall themselves. So we may put the thing about the bids, they actually knocked it down. And there was a thing came out, there was a hearing, the bids were to be heard this week, I think, in private, but no public was allowed. How can they make bids on something that doesn't exist anymore? And we can, they've already started bidding. Um, and that really shows that the sign of something wrong, does Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, let's move on from that. Thank oh, I'm sorry, yes? Hi, um, I'm helping to bring out one of the councillors in South Wimbledon, which is where this area is. So, a few, um, with the truth being expressed, that I just want to try and quickly address. And I was, if any of you have concerns about this, I mean, particularly if you're within my area, contact me about it. Really? So far, I have had no contact other from, um, sorry, who's on the news, I know, I hope that. I have had no complaints from there. There are 128 pupils already at the school, on the temporary side of Motley Avenue. None of their parents have contacted me to say how worried they are about this site. Um, I, I'm in contact with the head of Merton Abbey. Uh, he, he's had more than the opportunity to, to raise his concerns. He has some concerns about um, the ones that Sarah Wright points out about the, the access to the building. Uh, but his concern is, uh, as we've all talked about, air quality is an issue. He wants to do what he can to address air quality. He doesn't think that the school is going to um, make that any worse than it already has. Uh, it was just said that some of the Abbey um, Breakfast being passed over for the school, that's a lie. Rutledge Foundation owns um, the Nursery Road K Fields. Oh, no, 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 just a kind of stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Rutledge Foundation owns the um, playing fields in Nursery Road, and one of those is going to be able to be used by um, the secondary school, not as the one of the leaders put out by uh, another councillor, which said that the primary school pupils will have to go over there. That's an absolute lie. Um, and yes, the primary school pupils will have access to the um, playgrounds that are being proposed. But I just uh, I just reiterate that. So I've been to the meetings aimed at parents wanting to who were looking for schools to go to for their students, <coughs> and they were all in favour of the school. And their first questions were, "How do I get into it?" Can I respond, please? Can I have a quick response, please? Okay, John. If they were given a choice. Yes, in a moment, in a, in a moment, in a moment. So, so I, I will allow one or two more contributions, but Peter Walker um, has taken the opportunity to set out his case, and he has already asked, he's already given a recommendation tonight, which is, please lobby if you feel strongly about it. So I, I don't want to go on and on with it, but if you want to come back very briefly, and then I, I do really want to move on. Very briefly, the parents, the governors of, of Abbey um, Primary School have written in to express their concerns with a very similar to all our concerns. The, the grab of the green, the fact the school, the secondary school is going to be there, there's no provisions for bullying, even though there are provisions for the other school in, in uh, Watley Avenue, um, that they're, they're worried about the noise and the pollution during construction. They're worried about the pollution that's already happening there. Um, and also, on the nursery road, where you say, um, you know, the parents are really happy about this new school. I have met with parents outside Merton Abbey, and they haven't got a clue about what's happening just across their green. And secondly, the planning application, don't shake your head, please, Eleanor, 
The planning application does not have the facts. It does not have readings of pollution on the site. It does not have the mayor's report saying that Merton Abbey, right next to that school, is actually a polluted site and one of the most polluted in London. It does not have readings about air pollution on the roads, adjacent roads. It has projections for 2020 based on some unreal, you know, some unsubstantiated uh, facts. And it is using air quality levels of, um, it's using a measurement of 60 UG metric versus 40, which is the legal EU uh, standard. So they have completely misconstrued the air quality report. And that analyst who wrote the Harris report has twice been found to falsify or put erroneous um, um, air quality um, figures in because he was, was the same company that put the same figures in for the cement batching. Um, <laughs> everybody here might know about it. The cement batching, which had to be withdrawn because they put erroneous figures in there. So please do not insult us. Okay, so this is, this is no, no, no. Nobody's, uh, nobody's insulting you, obviously. So, so, Eleanor, if you want to come back briefly, you can. Peter, if you want to wind up, but that's fine, thank you. Uh, Eleanor, do you want to come back very briefly? Okay, that's fine. Uh, one more non councillor speaker. Sorry, it's at Eleanor's ward, that's why I have uh, that term. No? Okay, great, good, we're moving on. I'm banking that. No, I'm sorry to say you've spoken already, so I'm moving on. Right, next subject. Anything else under open forum? Yes, just a really quick one. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just, uh, I fully support everything that's written in here. I, I, I actually call upon the council to think that this is such an important thing. This is a school that hundreds and hundreds of thousands of children are going to pass through for decades. And if we've got an opportunity to build something now that impacts the lives of our children for the future, we should stop that project now, put it on hold, and build it in a better place as a matter of urgency where there's not the same terrible levels of pollution that we see there currently. So I fully support that. I call on Stephen Ambridge today to think again and read the detail of the report so that all the other sites have been mentioned across the borough. And despite the council saying they are not valid sites, when you do read the small print of those reports, they all say the same thing. Those sites are valid. They're good for schools, if not 1,200 peoples, certainly for 8 to 900 peoples, they're great sites. This is the opportunity. The council's not listening. The council needs to think again to address and find a better site for this school. Yeah. Okay, so we've run over the time for the open forum. Is there anybody else who wants to say something different briefly? Yes, madam. Not on the school, though, is that right? Not okay, on thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jane Dance, I speak on behalf of Friends of Morley Park, and I'd like to raise the issue of the continued closure of Morley Park. In September 2017, the Council signed a certificate of completion of all the works that Barclay Homes were required to do in Morley Park, before transferring the freehold to the Council. The works required included the eradication of Japanese knotweed. We do not understand why the certificate was signed as the works were not complete. Barclay Homes were obliged to complete these works before selling homes on their hospital development. So by signing the certificate, the council lost all leverage to ensure the park was transferred to them with all the works done and in a timely way. More than one year later, the park is still closed and owned by Barclay Homes who are using increasing areas of it to facilitate construction of their Wilson development site. We are told that the delay for the transfer is due to discussions on the liability for Japanese knotweed, but clearly Barclay Homes are finding continued closure of the park useful. The outcome of all this is that the Yersey Line High School doesn't have its playing fields, the public don't have access to the park. Areas of a uh, site of importance for nature conservation are strict for vegetation, and the council is at risk of incurring unnecessary costs. I propose that a motion is put to the council that the park should be transferred to the council and open as soon as possible, consistent with the planning consent and that there is increased scrutiny and transparency of this process. Well, thank you very much for that. For those of you who 
are regular attenders of the forum, you know that there is the mechanism for uh, me to put on your behalf a motion to the council, which is then debated or, or, or not debated by the council. What we've done up until now, and I, I didn't, but thank you for all you've said, I didn't know you were going to say that, but I'm glad you have. What, what, what uh, members of the forum have been happy with up until now is that I couch the motion in terms of asking the cabinet member responsible to look into the matter and then to report back. Um, are, are you happy as a forum if that is the way that I uh, put it this time? I, I do think it's the best way because, of course, if we put it in a very, if we put it in a confrontational way, then it's 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 likely to make less progress than if we put it in that way. So, uh, I, as the as the person who suggested, are you happy if I put it that way? Um, <coughs> It done in whatever way actually achieves results. Um, I, it doesn't sound very convincing to put it to the cabinet member. Well, I, it's your meeting, so so you or anybody else can suggest another way. So what would happen, just for those who are unfamiliar, is when I present the report of this forum to the council, as part of that process, I would move a motion, uh, and, and hopefully another member here of any political party um, would second that motion. Um, and then there would be the opportunity for the council to debate it, and the motion would be asking the council to agree something. So clearly we want the council to agree it, uh, I'm assuming, as a forum, so I'm suggesting that the wording that's most likely to be agreed, um, is, is, and, and therefore most likely to get action, is where we actually ask for action rather than predetermining uh, the end. So that, that, that would be my recommendation, but it's, it's your meeting. How if, do we know what, the, you know, what their findings so, are? So, we would, so, so what, we would, uh, what I would ask, if we were to go with this route, is, is I would ask that the Cabinet member reviews what has been discussed tonight, what we've heard tonight, and reports back. And either we, would invite, we could invite the Cabinet member as part of the motion to actually attend this meeting and to share their view, to share the results of that investigation themselves, that would be what I would suggest, or we could ask the cabinet member uh, to write so that at a future meeting uh, that can be read out. Um, if it was a planning pre uh, precondition, isn't there an enforcement issue there? And shouldn't that be going to pay as you use the land? Good luck. Well, we can put that in too if you want. I, I, it's your meeting, so I'm happy to put any motion that, 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 that you as, as, oh. as, as forum members want. But yes. Well, just a sideways point, and I don't really know the part about but the business about the Japanese knotweed is quite interesting because I don't know how they get rid of it, but as you know, the license phase has been counted in carcinogenic. So, uh, this obsession with trying to get rid of it, uh, how can you have a nature reserve that's had carcinogenic weed really killer put on it? So, could you not take out the provision about removing the Japanese knotweed? Because I, I think the, uh, uh, the, the subject of the Japanese knotweed is in many ways a red herring, and it's a red herring <coughs> which I think that the council have been using to considerable extent. I mention it simply because the council got themselves in a very strong position where they had an obligation on Barclay Homes, but Barclay Homes had to eradicate it. An impossible task. But that's what the legal document said. What the council have done by signing a certificate of completion is they have lost that leverage on Barclay Homes. Barclay Homes no longer have that obligation. And Barclay <coughs> Homes, it, it appears to me, are now taking liberties. Um, they are using parts of the <coughs> Um, the transfer of the park to the council has been delayed by over a year, and so the whole subject of Japanese novel is being, I, I, I think, used as something to disguise the fact that there is an underlying problem um, that all the leverage on Barclay Homes has been lost. So can I ask you, be bearing in mind what you've just said in terms of leverage and, and maybe in some cases the time has passed, can I ask you just to, and this is, this is great, this is what a public meeting should be about, can I ask you just to spend a couple of minutes drafting what you would like to put, and then you can put it to the meeting and see if the meeting agrees, and while you're doing that, the gentleman at the back has said he wants to speak. Yeah, I, on, on Japanese not me, just to convey some of the things about using chemical controls, is that there are biological controls, such as on the internet, there are a couple of companies which do all this. It's not cheap, because it involves employing a person, to come along with the relevant bugs that will only eat Japanese knotweed, because it comes from Japan, they don't eat anything else in, 
in the UK, and that can mitigate some of it. The other thing you can do is cut the leaves off and burn it and eat the stalks off. But it's a bit like rhubarb, and that's much the same thing. <laughs> I think one more, one more speaker, if somebody else wants to speak, so can come back a little bit more. Oh yes, thank you. So th this was raised at the Raised Park Forum last week, so the advantage of going to lots of forums, so uh, hear what's said elsewhere. And Neil Milligan, who's the uh, head of planning uh, development control at the council, was giving an update on this. Where is that at the moment is that the council is requiring Berkeley Highlands to take out an indemnity insurance against future spread of Japanese not with, not we. Um, and that's with lawyers at the moment to sign off, and then once that's signed off, we can then go to the transfer of the land. Okay, so, so in view of that from uh, Chris, thank you, Chris. Madam, would you still like to put your motion? Okay. Well, I have a go, but I don't have much time. Um, but the council be asked to report back promptly, and perhaps we put a, a time frame on that, something reasonable. I would, have, uh, I would have thought that three weeks, two weeks even, would, should be adequate, given that they must be very familiar with the process. And um, report back on how they propose to bring um, the, the negotiations with Barclay Homes on the transfer of the park to the council to a rapid conclusion. Okay, it, 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 with your permission, I would suggest a month, just to, because unfortunately things tend to move quite slowly. So if you're happy with that, uh, is everybody, is everybody sorry, happy to give a consent? Can I add one thing? Um, to bring the negotiations to a conference, <coughs> you can have the and um, open the park consistent with the terms of the planning consent. Okay, thank you for that. That, that's, that, sounds, that sounds really good. Chris, have you got it? Okay, everybody happy with that? As a, uh, yeah. as a council taxpayer, I would like to know if they're going to be paying anything to, to recognise the use of that land that they've, they've enjoyed. Okay, so that's, that's a, a, it should have been transferred back sometime ago. That's a question, so, so that would go in to the pot tonight and we'll come back to you with an answer to that too. <coughs> yes. And perhaps, should it be included in the motion that um, Robert Holmes removed um, all the materials well, it, it, again, uh, the suggestion from the front is should it be included that Barclay Homes are required to remove uh, vehicles, etc., on the site at the moment. My recommendation is to keep this realistic and, 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 and in the hope that uh, council officers engage positively, which I'm sure they will, and the cabinet member engages positively, which I'm sure they will. My, my recommendation would be not to add that bit, but, uh, but how does the meeting feel? Uh, is everybody happy? I will come to you in a moment. So is everybody happy with the motion as drafted? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's run with that. Last comment from you, sir, at the back, and then we're moving yeah, on. Yes, just to emphasize, Chairman, the, the situation with regard to Morley Park is quite absurd. I don't know whether other people are aware, but a year ago, Chair Baldwin was launched at the Open Day, uh, <coughs> on the part of the Pompey Beach Road. Just because the middle of Japanese is not being right, how ferocious that animal is, and however much it bites you, is a ridiculous excuse for not having uh, the market more than a year ago. And I really recommend that uh, uh, whoever is going to do it puts a suitable implement under Council's game by the way, whoever the Captain member, and get him or her, get a move on. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask potentially a, a dangerous question, which I might regret. Given we're now running well over time, is there anybody else who, like the three uh, speakers we've had so far, who, who's actually spent a lot of time preparing so they can say something? Good, you've had your chance. Okay, we'll, we'll, move, we'll move on. So, so thank you, everybody. So we're, we're moving on now. We've got Fiona Gaylor uh, from, uh, from the CCG. Uh, you're very welcome, Fiona. And you're going to talk to us about... Uh, the Merton Health and Care Plan. So thank you very much, and you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Can everybody at the back hear me? Yeah. No. I need to shout a bit louder. Yes. Is that better? Yeah. Lovely. Okay. And can everybody see this at the front? I have got some printed copies, which I'll leave on the side in case you want to look at it afterwards. Okay? So, as, as we've just been described, I'm here from Merton CCG to talk about the health and care plan and commissioning intentions. My name, as we said, is Fiona and I'm the Head of Patient and Public Engagement and Equalities for Merton CCG. 
So my job basically is to listen to people and to make sure that they have the opportunity to comment on our plans and that those are fed into decision makers. So, so I'm going to talk at you for about five minutes, but then I mostly want to hear from you and I hope you won't mind me writing down what you say because it's essential that I take that back and that other decision makers within the NHS hear what you said and then act on your feedback. So, who are we? So Matt and CCG, we are responsible for buying and planning healthcare services in Merton. As you probably know, you, it is a very affluent, uh, very diverse borough even. Um, we work with 24 GP practices and local partners, including, as you would expect, pharmacies, hospitals, dentists, mental health providers, the council, obviously, with the health and social care integration, and community groups, including Health Watch, who some of you may or may not know, they are the consumer champion for, um, for health and social care, making sure, like me, that people have the opportunity to input into health and care plans. And our aims are around three main areas, so improving health and wellbeing for the whole population, reducing health inequalities, which is a massive challenge, given some of the topics that you've been talking about earlier on, um, some of those bridge um, health inequalities as well, um, and making sure everyone has equal access to healthcare services. So why, it says why are we, why am I here today? Um, so we are in the NHS obviously always working to continuously improve the services that are provided to you, the public. Um, and we can only do that if we come out and talk to you and understand what's working, what isn't working, and actually learning from that feedback and changing services to meet what people need. So we have been coming along to meetings like this, smaller meetings, even bigger meetings, and listening to what people have said. Um, and we're going to be doing that until November um, to help inform plans for, this, for next year. Um, we, did, we do this every year, and this is called commissioning intention. So it basically is about what we intend to do next year, what we intend to focus on next year, and getting your feedback helps us know what to prioritise for next year. So some of our challenges, I'm sure you could probably list all of these off for me. You hear about the NHS challenges in the press daily. Um, people have longer to wait than they expect. We're facing unprecedented financial challenges. The quality of some of our services are variable depending on where you live. You might have a very different experience, even if it's just a couple of miles down the road. Um, not all of our buildings are in the best condition, and we need to invest money to make them better. Um, having good access to psychological therapies is a real challenge, and we know that, especially in Merton. Um, and the expected growth in our population puts additional pressure on the NHS. We have to pay more money to keep people, um, keep people well for longer, so that is a challenge for us. Um, and there's obviously always an increasing demand for new treatments and therapies. Things come up all the time that are um, new therapies that the NHS has to think about, whether it can afford to fund it or not, and, and rationalise that, which is always a challenge. So, we have an open mind, but not an empty mind. So there are some things that we are thinking about for next year as priorities. And these are really based on information that we have about the health needs of the population. The council produces um, a lovely document called the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment. I would highly recommend it if you have trouble sleeping. It's, it's beautiful, it's data rich, it gives a lovely picture of the health of people in the area and what some of the challenges are. And that's where we get a lot of our information about people in Merton. So there are three main areas that we're looking at in terms of priorities. So start well for young people, having a good start in life is obviously very important for healthcare. And under that, we have integrated support for children and families and support with emotional wellbeing and mental health. The second category is around to live well, so for working age people, it's thinking about well-being and long-term conditions, um, as well as mental health and well-being, which we know is a challenge. Um, and then age well, so as you, as you get older, it's thinking about how you can support people with complex health and care needs. So do you have long-term conditions? Are there kind of different, um, different issues going on for you in your life as you get older that mean you can't get out and about and you need a bit more support? 
So, as I said, this conversation here builds on a lot of work that we've already done, and for those of you who have got the presentation, I'll let you read that for yourselves, but there's, there's a bit of information there about what people have already told us about what they want from healthcare and what their priorities are. So, I've got two quite simple questions there, um, but I would propose to add a third, which is what you think about the priorities that I've talk, just talked through. Oh. There you go. So these are the things that we're thinking about focusing on for next year. That doesn't represent every single thing we will do, obviously, but these are the ones that we think we need to pay particular attention to next year. So I would invite you to give me some comments about whether you think those are the right things, whether you think we're way off track and we should be focusing on something else. And whilst you do that, I'm going to grab my notepad and make a note so I don't want you to feel like I'm not listening to you because I want to capture what you're saying. Would it? Lovely. Just, just start, and that's so I, got ready, but I feel really strongly about this. I, I think it's really crucial that it's easier for people to get GP appointments. Mm -hmm. It is almost impossible. I was worried about a health issue. I went on the online system about three times. There were never any appointments there. We tried phoning. The Nelson Medical Practice, it's a lovely building. It's a great opportunity, but you just cannot get appointments. And I think if people... I'm, you know, an educated person, I'm not, not stupid, I almost gave up. I almost thought, you know what, I just can't be bothered anymore. And I think that's quite sad and it's also dangerous because if you catch things early, they're probably going to be che cheaper to treat. Mm -hmm. So it's in everybody's interest to get people through the door when they need to see a GP. Absolutely. And it's almost impossible. That, for me, that has to be the priority. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. May I just ask two questions? Are you responsible for appointing the agency who deal with continuing health care? So our organisation is yes, but not me personally. So if you have a question about it, what I can do is yeah. make a note of it and then come back to you. I'd like to come back to you on it because I do have to raise some very, very serious concerns about the changeover and the impact it's had in particular within my own family. Setting that aside, the other issue I've said is I haven't noticed anything there about how we would work with the drug and alcohol needs with the bar. Yeah. And have you looked at the alcohol profiles of the UK and done the date, taken the data that public health can produce on that? So I can't answer that no. question, okay. but we can talk later. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I can follow up that question because we're coming up to winter and there will be people sleeping on the streets of the Broadway. And I am pleased that you've got mental health and well-being, but uh, the churches and uh, my wife runs the one of the church groups that put up the homeless in mm -hmm. over Christmas. And it's a scandal. And if you go to the Salvation Army in Kingston Road on Wednesday and Friday, we've got loads of homeless people from across the borough being fed for free. Mm -hmm. And these people are mental health, drug, alcohol problems. We had one of the four chaps died outside Morrison's last winter. Mm -hmm. So there's many things for people who are reasonably healthy, but my heart goes up, and I'd really like, uh, because these people tell us they can't register yeah. if they're homeless, and yeah. they're the most vulnerable mentally, so I'd like that to be looked at. Yeah, so all I would say on that in terms of registering, the, the CCG has a responsibility to offer primary care to homeless people. Yes, it is a challenge with registry, but there are things in place for homeless people to get access to primary care. It might be that they don't know about it, so there's something in there about raising awareness of that service. Will you tell the YMCA, because yeah. they coordinate for the homeless people at Christmas. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point, thank you. Uh, just at the very back. Yes, you, yes, okay. yes. Thank you. Um, I think if you look around, you can have to see that uh, the vast majority of people here are great, part of the grey population, and I've been absolutely appalled since moving to the borough at the lack of coordinated care, especially in Nelson Medical Centre. Which medical is Nelson? Nelson, yes. Um, I mean, uh, like I said, you said, you know, it's a, it's a <coughs> great practice, there are lots of facilities there, but there's no coordination for people, there's no special doctors or GPs who can deal with ageing, and this is such an important issue now. People who are aging have <coughs> needs, and problems, just like children do, just yeah. like you know, um, young families do, but there's no special service for them. It's almost as if they've 
been written off. And I would really urge you to just across the borough, not just there, but to have some sort of coordinated policy that will I've been there so many times and seen so many different doctors. And I don't I don't think they would be that bothered about problems mm. and aging. <coughs> that's something I think you, know, you want to keep people in their homes, you want to keep them yeah. fit and healthy. So so do something about it in a coordinated way. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Any other non-councillors first? And then... There was another question. I think there was another question over here somewhere. Oh, but he's a councillor. No, okay. <laughs> so non-councillors <laughs> first. I just have one question. Um, yes. You know the idea of a green gym? Yeah. Um, I mean, there are a lot of opportunities. Merton, with the green spaces management and stuff, there's some wonderful opportunities starting next year um, with future Merton and uh, future Wimbledon Town. And we, we need a green gym organized, and I would assume that you guys would be the people to, to be sort of the central point. But there, there are RHS volunteers in Wimbledon, there are um, community groups who'd love to put, I mean, the Green Coffee, for example, who would bring people to help do work out, outdoor space, you know, camaraderie, exercise, fresh air. A spark of life, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I think that's that's where the kind of partnership with the council and with voluntary and community organisations is really important to achieve that. So yeah. on that middle one uh, and, and age well, you can could do a huge amount very quickly, I think. Okay, that's a really good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Any other non... Um, uh, yes. Um, regarding that uh, it's outsourced to a company house so the public um, so the public health stuff yeah. yeah. so, so public health is managed by the council but my colleagues here um, but I can take that back and pass that on that in fact that it's not accessible. Okay, yes, sir. Yeah. On your bit about your, your building, <coughs> is it worth you? I want a bit about your building. So yes. Obviously, I understand there's a problem with funding of the NHS from central government and other bits and what you can do elsewhere. But one would have thought with a bit of imagination. <coughs> that you could speak to the development parts of that council <coughs> and their ideas of how they wish to change uh, the bit around the, um, uh, the, uh, the area of eviction and, and of all the most other parts of that, how you can integrate yeah. things, things which are obviously not a risk for the people, but yeah. where housing associations are like effectively digging the foundations to stick in the roof on. If you haven't got to worry about that and your, your service is within the middle of it, mm. is this something which you should be exploring? Have you been exploring? And is Merton Council happy for you to explore it? So I don't think I can answer some of that. However, I think our estates team would be very, very open to that and working with the council on it. I can't vouch for whether they have had conversations about it. I would assume they probably have. Um, but I think it's definitely a good point that I can talk to colleagues about and we can think back on. And just to remind everybody, I know I say this a lot, but it's important. So these comments that people are making, and particularly ideas that are given, like both the last two speakers, Chris is capturing those. Yeah. Um, part of what he does is he sends those comments to the relevant officers. So that's the whole point. You do Your views are being fed into the process. And the reason I begin the evening by asking councillors to identify themselves is, of course, you've now got your representatives here as well, who will also, I hope, be in the process. And what, oh, sorry, what I was going to say, which is on the very end side, is what we're going to do with this. So, <coughs> obviously, Chris has been taking notes, I've been taking notes. We'll collaborate to make sure that we've captured everything. But what we're doing is going to use everything that you've said, everything we've heard from all the other groups we've been to, pass that on to the people who are making the decisions, um, and then we're going to develop a report that we will share via Chris with anybody that wants to see it. It will go on our website so you can see what this group and what everybody else has said and then what we've actually done about it or, or explaining why we can't do things with it because that's always frustrating, I find, not finding out what happens. So we're committing to do that for, to you, for you and everybody else that's responded as part of this. Okay, yeah, thank you. That's great, Anthony. Um, building on the future point, I'm going to ask 
there's been any measurement of the loss of the walk-in centre at the Wilson, so you didn't have to register for a GP to get health services. And I know you now have the hubs where you can bring up and get out of hours GP appointments, but you do have to be registered. So is there any measurement of that? Uh, and secondly, I wanted to very quickly add a, one positive for Nelson. As the father of a nearly three-year-old, so it's always very easy and very quick um, and sorry to get an appointment for, for him, which is great for, for him, but maybe less so for other people. Mm. So to respond to your point about kind of measurement of the loss of the Nelson and presumably the impact on surrounding services if people are going there, um, the primary care team will have done something about that. Obviously, I don't have that data here, but we can respond to that and give a bit of feedback. I used to work in South East London, um, and I know that they closed a number of their walk-in centres, and anecdotal evidence from South East London was that they didn't really see an increase in A&E attendances, but they did see more people using the GP hubs. So that's anecdotal evidence from other areas, but we can find out specifically about the Nelson. Okay, uh, you, anybody who hasn't yet spoken, Okay, last, last contribution. I just ask you a question. Are you going to your commission? Does this involve also looking at what you've already done and assessing whether you should continue it, or are you just looking to move ahead with new things? Or are you evaluating what you've already done? Yeah, so it's both things. It is looking at what's already being done and whether that's good and achieving what it should be achieving. Um, but also it is about looking forward and kind of the, and in a way the commissioning bit is reviewing what's happening and therefore reprioritising what we need to focus on. So it's both things, so absolutely. Are you really outsourcing of physiotherapy to a third party or profit organisation? Um, because I might use that quite extensively and everyone I've met and use it has been absolutely appalled by the service they have from this outsourced company. Okay. I have actually made complaints to Nelson about it. Okay. Um, but I am quite happy to email you privately uh, about right. my experience. And every single person that I've spoken to there has been dissatisfied. Yeah. And this company is making money out of our taxes mm -hmm. and money from Merton. Yeah. Um, and I think it's very important that outsourced organisations are actually monitored mm -hmm. and held to certain standards. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I would really like to contribute to any uh, review that you're doing about that company. Yeah. So I think what I'll do is, before I leave, I'll kind of stand at the back for five minutes, and I think there are a couple of you that wanted to exchange emails, so if we do that before I leave, then I can follow up afterwards, if that's all right. Okay. Um, Fiona, thanks so much. Thanks for coming Thank to see us, and, and thanks for, for saying that you'll make sure everything's fed back yeah. uh, properly. Um, yeah. item is the annual uh, uh, report by the leader of the council. So this is uh, discussed two areas. It's firstly an opportunity for the leader to, for Stephen to tell us what is in his inbox and the major issues coming across his desk and uh, to give us a flavour of what he's working on. Um, and then it's secondly an opportunity obviously for you to ask questions and to give your uh, ideas to him and raise your concerns. So Stephen. Thank you, James, and thank you for inviting me. So I've done this is the second of the community forums. So the first one was about 10 days ago at uh, Grace Park. And what I intend to do is to go uh, through a Merton-wide number of issues, not necessarily a Wimbledon-centric, so that you can get a picture of what's happening throughout the borough, the pressures on the borough, uh, like many other London boroughs, including national boroughs, and also to go through some of the hope that hopefully we're providing uh, in these times of austerity, some of the issues we're looking at, uh, the pinching our finances, make sure we don't go down the route of the Phantom Council, which is going to bust or has gone bust, and come out uh, with a vision for the borough that is about hope and about something uh, sticking out of the ground that is useful and good for people to use to look at and uh, as, a, as a nice contribution to the place. So thank you for inviting me and delighted to be here. Um, now, as with any council leader throughout the country, what they would say to you is these are very, very tough times financially for all local authorities. So in the next three to four years, we as a borough uh, have to find around 19 million pounds. 
So we will find that uh, because we as a borough are a legal borough. We will have a balanced budget each year, each March, and we will be legal and we will run the council. And we will not, like Northampton, allow a government minister to come and run this borough for us because we're a business-like borough. And we will get through these very, very uh, difficult times. Those difficult times are uh, mainly because of two pressures. One on adult social care, huge pressure on adult social care uh, throughout all boroughs, including this one in the London Borough of Burton, and pressures on uh, children's services as well. Just two examples. In Cannon Hill Ward, where I live, there's a 40% increase in people living over 85 years of age, and that's what we want. We want to, uh, for people to live longer, to live better lives and longer, and into their 80s, into their 90s. But that does have ramifications for adult social care budgets for the London Borough of Merton. And we're determined uh, to see what we can do, hopefully with help from the government, to uh, uh, satisfy our statutory duty to the most vulnerable, to the elderly in this borough. And we will do that uh, come what may. Uh, children's services, another area where I don't know if many of you know it, but the borough is a corporate parent. The borough acts as a parent to children whose parents don't want them, don't need them, can't look after them, and we have about 135 of those. And children's services is the only area that is inspected by Ofsted in a very, very hard and intriguing manner, but also very, very uh, testing manner. So without notice, inspectors come from Ofsted to all boroughs that have a children's service and pour over everything that we do with regard to children's safeguarding, fostering, adoption. Again, I'm talking about the most vulnerable children in this borough, and they pour over that, and then they make an assessment. And this borough, this London Borough of Merton, is outstanding in a number of areas for children's services. In leadership, that's the political leadership in working with management, in safeguarding, one of the most important areas, the children in this borough are safe tonight, as I speak, in adoption and in fostering, one of the two services, two services that are applauded and lauded by other local authorities. Wandsworth, with half its council tax, was inspected by Ofsted, children's services inadequate. I will not have that here in the London borough, but we will look after the most vulnerable the elderly and the youngsters. We will do that, and that will be a pressure point on us, which means that those budgets, adult social care and children's services, will be looked up. And I'm pleased that we found £9 million pounds of growth, growth money, which is very, very unusual for our children, for our adult social care, and a million pounds for uh, children's services. Obviously, those pressures added to by the government with a 63% cut in our budget over the last few years. So if your household budget was cut by 63%, you would have some very, very difficult decisions to make. If you have a three-bedroom house, you may have to close down one of the bedrooms. If you have an extension, you may have to close that extension down. If you have two showers, you may have to use just the one shower. If you have a takeaway five, six times a night, you may just have to have <coughs> two nights, and so it goes on. And that's what local authorities have to do if a chunk of their money all of a sudden is, is cut back. So 63% <coughs> in our government support. But we don't just sit back and moan. We take action to make sure that we save money in certain areas. In an entrepreneurial and in an innovative way. So as we all know, lawyers are very expensive. We all know that. And so the London Borough of Merton is the lead borough in setting up the South London Legal Partnership. Five boroughs, one legal service, the South London Legal Partnership, led by the London Borough of Merton. 80 lawyers based in Morden, doing the law for four other boroughs, including Merton, including Wandsworth. Wandsworth increasingly is coming to us to run services for them. The trailblazing borough, the flagship borough of Margaret Thatcher, comes to the London Borough of Merton for us to run some of these services. And I'm very, very, very proud of that. Regulatory services, so when you go to the pub, you expect the publican to give you a good measure, weights and measures. You go to a restaurant, you expect the food to be safe, to be nutritious, 
happen to be delicious but safe, and uh, licensing, hours of work, trading standards, counterfeit goods, regulatory service run by Merton, shared service, Richmond wants with Merton. And those shared services save money for those boroughs, led by the London Borough of Merton, so that we don't have to make as drastic cuts as we would have to, to children's services and to adult social care. In a borough <coughs> that is affluent in Wimbledon, <coughs> you catch a 200 bus from the village, four miles, 20 minutes, down to Mitcham, Longevity, life expectancy difference between female in the village, female in the village, 13 years. 13 years. That is what we're here to do, to close that gap, to bridge that gap. If we have any extra money in the London Borough of Merton, we will allocate that to make sure that it closes that gap whenever possible. We also tried to uh, get income uh, generation. So the Civic Centre, three floors of that Civic Centre, Crown House in Morden, by the Tube Station, 1960s building, no change whatsoever, no carpets in the lifts, all that. We just get on with it. We're not asking for a new conference centre, we're not asking for a new uh, uh, town hall. It's functional, it works for us. We will use it, but we're sweating it. Three floors, let out for income for the borough. And when you see some lights on, and a lot of people come up and say, Stephen, those lights are on all night. What is going on there? It's a waste of money. I say, it's not a waste of money. It's the CCTV bank. Whole bank of CCTV cameras working with the police to, know, to, to identify any issues that are coming around both day and time. And I know a number of you, and I, this is Canon, Hill Ward or Lower Morden were a bit concerned about the festival that we, uh, that we put in place in, in, in Morden Park to use the park to raise funds. We raised £80,000 by having a two day festival that brought 20,000 youngsters into Morden so they could see Morden. Yes, they did all behave themselves. Yes, they did things they shouldn't have done. Yes, some of that drill music was over the top. But we're learning all the time. We need to engage more and more with the residents. But I will not have a park just sitting there uh, 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 without being used. So we will continue to look at our parks to see if we can have any events there. So in terms of folk uh, libraries, this library, this used to be the old reference library. I remember my reference library in Fulham. Lovely, lovely smell. Uh, Britannia, uh, Britannica, <coughs> Encyclopedia and so on. This is fully booked to the 25th of November. It is fully booked, it is chock a block. Again, income coming in to the local authority for sweating of assets. Colliers with brand new library. Please name me a local authority that's opened a brand new dementia friendly library, opened by Brian Moore, the rugby player, not long ago. It came second in the National, uh, in the National Library Awards to Liverpool, where I've just come back from from the Labour Party Conference, a great city. West Barnes, we, the Cabinet has agreed a replenishment, a brand new library, whatever. Obviously, we need to wait for Crossrail to, to see what's happening there. But West Barnes is next in line to get a brand new library. But Crossrail 2 is critical, uh, is critical uh, to that. Schools, 23 primary schools expanded in the teeth of opposition sometimes by some people, creating 4,400 extra primary school places. Extra primary school places. We could have built a new school in the village or in Wimbledon Park or somewhere else, but we expanded great schools, outstanding schools, well led by their head teachers, and created 4,400 primary schools because that is a statutory duty. I cannot, as a leader, not provide enough school places. I must, and most of those are first preference, over 80% for our parents. And less and less parents are sending their children out of borough. It's a shame. We want our children to come in borough, to the schools in borough. Outstanding schools, Ursula, Rutledge, Rickards. Outstanding schools. Outstanding primary schools. And that's what we want. And the Department for Education and government ministers, I'm the Labour leader here, but I get letters from Conservative 
education minister saying, well done, Stephen, on what you do in education, because this borough is number one in the country, according to the Department for Education, for progressing children, key stage two to key stage four, 11 years old to 16. Now, if they go to a private school or a grammar school, they're clever. They've been selected. And they're going to come out clever. And I'm not denying those teachers are doing well. And you get, you, you, they, they keep a consistency. But as an educationalist, one that believes in state education, isn't it great that without selection, children join our schools at the age of 11, and this borough is tops in the country for improving them, all abilities, by the time they get to the age of 16 and they do their GCSEs. And that takes a lot of work and a lot of money by our schools improvement team. Great credit to head teachers, to teachers, to parents, to governors, and to the children. Not taking anything away from them. But let's agree that it is a partnership. And we've had a brand new head teacher recently joined us. He says, Stephen, I've been a head teacher in other boroughs, and the support I get from this London borough of Merton is unbelievable in terms of running my school. And that is a lot of money that goes to those two people. Regeneration, redevelopment, things that stick out of the ground. I used to work at the Federation of Small Businesses. Construction industry is hugely important to this country. And when I'm driving behind the skin, I'm not frustrated, I'm not angry, I know there's work there. I know something is happening, something is being built. And that's why it's important that we as a borough have things going on. So Clarion, our housing association, 2,800 extra units, respecting all the social uh, uh, housing that's already there, one billion pound investment in the Hyde Park, the Ravensbury, and at East Fields. Dave Hill, has anyone heard of Dave Hill? A London commentator. He's recently retired from The Guardian. He knows everything and anything about London and London boroughs. Dave Hill. He wrote, following the debacle uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Harrogate about regeneration, consulting or not consulting with residents. He said the London Borough Merchant is an exemplar in consulting residents on these three regenerations. And those ugly towers not that you see, those towers that you see on the high path, they're going to go. They are going to go. Not true. They are going to go to be replaced by good houses. <laughs> Morden Town Centre, yes, uh, the previous administration, I've got to give them credit as well, uh, started the More Morden Project in 2008. We had the global financial crisis. Not much interest, but now there is interest. So, Morden Town Centre, the start of the line, not the end of the line, the start of the line in, by 2021, we will start to renovate, repurpose, <coughs> have a better shopping offer for residents have a public rail space outside the tube station, move the buses a bit further along, perhaps build a depot for the buses so that there is some kind of shopping experience in Morden. AFC Wimbledon, in the teeth of opposition from Boris Johnson. Do you remember Boris Johnson? He was the Mayor of London and he objected to a fan-based club coming back to where they used to be. AFC Wimbledon, Brand new stadium, 11,000 going up to 20,000. December 2019 will be ready for a fan base club with all the regeneration around Wimbledon Park that that will bring to that area. Morden Leisure Centre, Pelican, a great big company. The owner there, I think, that, I, I do believe that they're, they're Dutch. The owner there said it is one of the best settings for a leisure centre that he's ever built and he's built some leisure centres throughout the world. More than a leisure centre, 25 metres, six lanes, diving pool, cat facility, disability facilities, and it goes on and on. In a park, 100 station fitness gym, looking out onto a lovely superlative park. The old one is still running. When the new one opens, the old one closes and returns to green space. So not a blade of grass will be lost by having a brand new swimming pool in a park. Uh, I think we spoke about the Wilsons, and that should be coming 
to fruition in 2022, uh, not only as a health centre, but also as a centre for issues like employment, getting people into work as well. Colliers Wood, you have the brand new uh, 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 Town and Root Tower. Brown and Root Tower, much looking a bit better. Mitcham, we discovered Mitcham, we've planted £7 million pounds into there. And I know there'll be a discussion on Wimbledon and, uh, and so on. On Crossrail 2, all the parties are, 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 are agreed. We do regularly sit down on all party issues and all the parties, just like they signed up to the return of AFC Wimbledon to the borough, have said yes to Crossrail 2, but not at any cost to Wimbledon Town Centre. And that is in the annals of the TFL. They dare not change that. So if we do get Crossrail 2, it won't mean the destruction of, uh, of, of, um, of Centre Court. Just finally, on recycling, isn't it awful when you see these pictures of our rubbish being put into the earth? Called landfill, it costs us money. It is a disgusting approach and way of getting rid of our waste. Landfill, and it's got to stop. We've got to increase the uh, recycling in this borough. So, as you will know, from the 1st of October, there's a new waste collection service that will save us this year £1.6 million and £2 million thereafter by moving to a mill, a wheelie bin based service. And we hope that we will increase our recycling from 37% to 45%. Sutton's has shot up to 50% since they took up the wheel bin service. Hopefully cleaner streets, and we'll also be collecting clothes, batteries and shoes uh, uh, if you want. And yes, Viola have not covered themselves in glory, and yes, I am sorry for their, uh, for their performance. We have deducted from the contract. How about? 10% of the annual contract. And how much is that? That is a lot of money, hundreds how of thousands. Much? I can get that to you. I can get it, but it's hundreds of thousands of pounds. And 17 to 18 was when we deducted that. And we're quite happy to deduct again. Now, finally, um, we do rely on a lot of volunteers here in this London Borough of Merton. And the cabinet, uh, a couple of weeks ago, proposed a paper to invest around a million pounds in our voluntary sector because there are people out there who need advice and need help. We can't afford lawyers. So our voluntary budget goes from strength to strength. Wimbledon Guild get £43,000. The Citizens Advice Bureau, where people who have no access to legal advice, where the legal aid system has been decimated, we're funding that to the tune of 340,000. The South West London uh, uh, Law Centre, 56,000. Uh, Merton Centre for Independent Living, 80,000. Age UK, uh, 73,000. And we will continue to invest in the voluntary sector so people get the advice when they need it. I'm sure there'll be a question on Harris. I'll cover it now, but I'm sure. Uh, there will be a question, but let me cover it down. So, you heard me say that uh, we have a duty to make sure there are adequate school places for our primary school children. And we expanded 23 primary schools, creating 4,400 extra places for our children. They grow to be the age of 11, they need school places. So we have a secondary school strategy that means we need a brand new school in the London Borough of Merton. When you get a, a, a brand new school, the law dictates it has to be a free stroke academy. So we have a deal with uh, Harris who have just announced through Ofsted that their school in Morden, has anyone heard of Garth Road School? Yeah. Bishopsford School. Can anyone tell me whether they were good schools? <laughs> whether they were outstanding schools, whether they were looking after the children, whether the children were coming out with good standards. No, it is an outstanding school. I'm interested in results. I'm interested in how children prosper. And they've only got one chance, and it's in those four years or five years or seven years at a, uh, at a good school. 
This council is a, is a traditional local authority education state school system. But there are academy schools here, and they do us proud. And so we uh, put together a proposal to the Department of Education, and they've agreed that proposal. So the Harris Federation, the Department for Education, the Department for, uh, uh, for Skills and Funding, they're the ones that are putting in the planning commission in South Wimbledon, in the High Path, for a brand new school that has already started in an educational establishment, the former adult education college in Watley Avenue in Cannon Hill, that is now being run excellently by Merton College because the funding for that was cutting, cutting, cutting. We would have had to have cut further education in mid-term. I didn't want to do that. 128 children oversubscribed. Ask those parents. Next year, another 128 children are going to the Harris Wimbledon. And in September 2020, the vision is that there should be a brand new secondary school at the Hyde Park. And if you have any concerns, if you want to put your views forward, all buildings that need planning permission are subject to the Planning Applications Committee. That is a quasi-judicially run committee that runs on the basis of information from experts, whether it's the Department for Education who build schools, whether it's the Environment Department or flooding, as it was the result of FC Wimbledon, and there will be an air quality discussion at that panel meeting. There will be conditions applied on a raft of issues so that we get the school right. But I want you to know that the parents are very much looking forward to that school opening at the high path. And if you look at any school that's been built in central London, where there isn't a blade of grass, it's always very, very difficult in terms of space and in terms of play. But I do believe that it's all subject to planning, and that's where we all put our concerns in. I'm confident that that planning committee will take the right decision based on the evidence that they're going to be given by yourselves if you put in your objections or your support, by the parents, by the head teacher next door, by the air quality consultant, by all those experts that are going in. These are very, very difficult decisions where to put things, but at the end of the day, it's important that we as a local authority satisfy our statutory duty for school places, but it is all subject to that planning applications committee. Mm. Thank you. Okay, uh, Steve, thank you very much. <laughs> so we have uh, 45 minutes left now in total. Uh, unfortunately, because the building needs to be locked up, we're not allowed to run over. We have, as you know, uh, 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 another very important item tonight, which is Paul and Gary is here to talk to us about the Wimbledon Town Centre plan. Um, unfortunately, however short we make the agendas, we always seem to have time issues. But obviously, Stephen has raised a, a lot of important points um, in his address to us. So, so I, I'm keen to take as many comments and questions as possible. But could I just ask you to keep them as absolutely as quick as you can, and answers to be really quick too, yeah. so we can hear as many people as possible. Yes, sir. Really quick, though, please. Um, I had a meeting with you were at and uh, Ann Holman. You said that in respect to the former industrial building over on the Willow Lane Trading Estate, which is currently used as residential accommodation, arguably in a substandard manner, um, that you were disinclined to apply compulsory purchase on that because you didn't want to effectively disenfranchise the proprietor's interest in that land. That basically building to a life and everything else, even if that might actually improve the conditions of people who happen to be resident in our borough. Can I ask, either have you reconsidered that decision, or if you're willing to stick with it, can I have your confirmation that you're also not reconsidering the, the use of compulsory purchase to disenfranchise other people of their proprietary interest in land? Okay. okay, good, thank you. Thank you for the answer, please. I need to talk to you. Are you referring to the warehouse or factory, the willows that is now housing? 
Sit down with you and discuss which one you're talking about. Okay, good. Next Thank question. You sure comment. Yes, it's a black. Yep. I have a question. So you, you have a lot of confidence in your, your planning applications committee. I wonder how many people in this room or in this borough have that amount of confidence in your planning applications committee, given the monstrosities you are currently building in this borough and given the number of reports that are produced that are factually incorrect. And that the residents of this borough have to put up with officers and councillors lying during those planning committees and scrutiny committees, which your legal compliance officer refuses to investigate. But that's why we're here tonight, to hear about the future. So yeah. can we move on to the future, please? And see what I'm so excuse me, I'm asking a question. I'm not going to answer the problem. But okay, so what? So what? What's the good time? So what is your question? Can you ask? Can you ask your question? No, just, 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 just. just. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have one speaker at a time. So, would you please ask your question, or we'll have to move on? Ask. ask your I know. I know. I, I, he doesn't have to ask it again. I know uh, what the question is. I do not recognise the description that you give of the uh, Planning Applications Committee and the uh, processes that are legally run in this borough. If there was anything illegal or circumspect, you can go to the Local Government Ombudsman, you can take us to the High Court, you can take us to the House of Lords, you can do whatever you like, but no one has yet, so it's your option. We run a good council, the Planning Applications Committee has discretion, they are uh, legally elected councillors of this borough, they are trained in how to receive information from the officers, you are impugning the officers of this local authority, we are a local authority that does everything by the law, we have internal audit, we have external audit, we have judicial reviews that we beat left, right and centre, we have the Heritage Society coming in saying everything's fine, we have everyone coming in questioning on the basis of quite rightly you or others calling them in and we win Hands down, every time. Thank okay, you. Good. Next question. Another question. Yes, madam. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any way that we can get more be hostile about this. You have planning officers who are overworked. The numbers have been reduced. Enforcement officers have been cut down. There are vacancies. People are very concerned that hard-working planning officers who are qualified, they are experienced people, are being put under too much pressure without the support they need in order to deliver the quality service that you aspire to. So I don't think the sort of yarboo to and throwing is a helpful way forward. We want to, if we want to aspire to a future Wimbledon and a future Merton that we can be proud of, we need a quality planning service to deliver it. And I would like to suggest that that is made a priority and not an afterthought. Yeah. 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 You are right, there is pressure on planning and on enforcement. We have to decide what our priorities are. Are the priorities the extension in the village, or the basement application in the village, or the fact that a neighbour quite rightly is concerned that the party law agreement is actually uh, collapsed and the council should step in to sort all that out. So yes, there have been decisions taken that have meant a 
lower priority in planning and in, in enforcement so that we can look after the vulnerable and the elderly. These are difficult, difficult choices, but I do appreciate them. But, but even if we had a fully budgeted, uh, up and running, well resourced planning applications uh, system, uh, I think people do get quite rightly very, very excited about planning. What I've tried to bring here for you all is a balance, for, for my point of view, of looking at, for example, John and Jane's desire about the aesthetics of their front garden and the fact that those two wheel bins will make it look ugly. Okay. Ed Michaels, wait, why haven't you finished? Ed Michael, who lives in Exeter, but his mum is 90 years old and needs to come home to Cannon Hill, and we need to make sure her flat or her house is ready for her to move into. They don't see each other's plight, but we as councillors see both their plight, and we have to make a choice. And the aesthetics of your front garden, I'm afraid, have to take the following. Let me look after the elderly person first. I'll get back okay, to you. Short, short questions and short answers, please. Yes. Um, I want to have good faith in your planning department. And I would love it, actually, if, if uh, you take your committee and uh, the Democratic Services people put all the names in a hat and just plucked out the number needed for a meeting. I think that would prove that it's a, a truly democratic process. So that I'm, I'm just setting aside. But following, um, there's a very big and exciting planning application coming down the pipeline. It's rumbling bigger and more magnificently by the hour. And that is the music space on the P3 site. And I know I, I understand that you have given your support to that, but it seems to be a conditional support. And I just wanted if you tell this audience, which is, these are Wimbledon people, this is the Wimbledon Forum, and this is extremely important to the future of Wimbledon Town, and we see that as the crux of the regeneration of the, the town area. And we would like to hear your support of the music space okay. on the P3 site. Can we, can we have that? Thank you. Yeah. I have, uh, Zanthony, Zanthony, so I've had various discussions with Anthony Wilkinson, from the Women and Call Society with regard to their aspirations for a major uh, concert hall behind uh, Morrison's uh, car park. Morrison's car park comes back to the council in 2019 and goes back to us. So we're, we're in discussions with various developers in the team. So I have done a letter, a, bit, a series of letters that Anthony can use as he tries and hopefully succeeds raising millions of pounds. So what I'm looking for is deliverability, that they can raise the 100 million pounds and sustainability. The council will sit back and watch this superlative vision take root. But it is all subject to the planning applications committee. Okay, thank you. Can I, I want to make a suggestion that, as I always said, your meeting is half an hour left. We, the, the future uh, of the Wimbledon Town Centre and the Wimbledon Plan, I think, is absolutely critical, and we're already down to half an hour. Stephen um, has his email address on the council website. I think there's even a telephone number on the council website. So it is your meeting. If someone puts up their hand, I will take you. But, but oh, and yeah, he's also saying he'll stay behind. So can, can we move on? Is everybody happy to move on? Yeah. Okay, well, Stephen, I'd like to say, as it was brought up about the constable, uh, I've actually commissioned probably the greatest architect in the world, Frank Geary. And I know that a big burden on the council is um, money. Now, Frank Geary's uh, famous Guggenheim uh, Museum in Bilbao is estimated to have bought in 4 billion euros to that um, uh, city. So I would like that to be taken into consideration, that this could actually give Wimbledon an extraordinary pulling power and a lot of money coming into the so if you are after money in the future, you should really take this proposal very seriously. I'll take it. Thank you. Has said that he will stay behind afterwards. So please feel free to talk to him then. And his email address is on the council website, and, and there is a telephone number for him on the council website too. Stephen, thank you for coming along. Now, Paul, over to you. 
So Paul McGarry, for those of you who don't know, is head of the future Merton, I think. And, uh, and Paul is a regular visitor here, so Paul, thanks for having joining us this evening. Uh, thank you, and good evening. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, if you can't, come forward, because the louder I talk, the more Scottish I get. It's probably isn't great for the video. Um, but interesting discussion there just about the planning service. Um, because it is a question of how the council deals with applications, uh, and actually how you as a community can help shape the town centre and how we work with you. Um, I should say I manage Future Merton, it's a magical team in the council, with an equally magical name. Uh, and what we do is we set the agenda for all the planning policies and future development of the borough. There are two planning teams in the council, one deals with applications, um, as you just said, the NTO, very hard. My team deals with strategy and policy. And we've been working with you as a community for quite a while on the master plan. And um, lo and behold, we now have one. Uh, we're going to launch it on Monday. But I'll give you an introduction to it tonight. Um, I've actually just been to design a review panel tonight. Um, talked about the master plan for an hour, and that wasn't long enough. So I'm not going to do it justice tonight. But I'm happy to, uh, if you have any rest of the meetings, I'm happy to for me and my team to come and attend for the next two months. So just tonight, what we're going to do is give you a bit of feedback on the master plan status. <coughs> it's not a fact, it's a planning manual for everything, it's quite a practical document, and I'll explain why. I'll talk about the master planning process, because we're actually at the end of it, it's easy to forget all the hard work we've done already uh, to help us get here. Um, and it's about a strategy for growing an already successful town centre. Um, one that's growing to 10 million people, um, the economy is still booming, population is there, and places do have to evolve and change. Um, and we can't just bend our head in the sand over that, but what I hope this plan does is it shows a sensible and measured way of managing that change. Uh, and of course, Crossroads 2 was mentioned tonight, and that would be a huge factor. Um, I'll talk about then the ongoing engagement that's about to come. Um, I'm also going to <coughs> commend the author of that cartoon, because they're in the audience tonight. Um, this, I think, exemplifies what planning the future of Wimbledon Town Centre means. There are lots of different discussions about different plans. There's lots of really interesting groups all trying to do their own thing. And that's good. There's that ongoing conversation about the future of planning. And it isn't just left to the council. So I think that's a really encouraging step. Just so you know, there is um, essentially a neighbourhood plan being considered for Wimbledon. My team are assisting that community group and how they might bring that forward. <clears throat> and I don't think that clashes with the master plan, which I'm about to talk about. They can sit side by side. Um, so, the diagram on the left to you. Uh, this is where the master plan for Wimbledon will sit in terms of the planning hierarchy. And the reason that sounds very boring and techy is because this is what planning applications committee <coughs> and development control team use to assess applications. And some of the criticism we've had in the last couple of years has been it's not going to be a bit of planning policies, but what does it mean? What does it look like? When planning applications commit to see planning applications randomly, it's quite hard to see how do they look like all sitting next to each other. It feels as if we've all the bits of the jigsaw. Right. I, I really haven't heard a word yet. You've done it so when it comes to planning, it feels as if we put all the bits of the jigsaw, we don't have the picture on the front of the box. And this master plan creates it with a lot of community input, helps us get it. Up at the top is all the big national planning policies. We can't change that, we can't take any of that. So that is uh, the national planning framework, the mayor's long term plan, and all the attachments that go with it. Sorry, keep going, keep going, thank you. Um, we have to fit within the framework, it's just not, we have, it has to fit into a legal framework, um, so it's a bit techy, but that's what it is. We are currently in the process of reviewing that as local plan anyway, so any new policies which we desire to implement will have to be a local plan. What the future of the master plan is, it's supplementary to a couple of existing policies. Principally, when we turn the centre policy, the tall buildings policy and design policy. Um, so that's what we're going to focus on. After that, it then informs Merton's usual planning system. 
But the team and I had quite a lot of fun and actually digging into the history of Wimbledon. Um, the doctor has all that in, so you can see it online shortly. Wimbledon's getting a lot of history of development. Um, unlike other major towns, like Guildford, Croydon, and Kingston, they were already established towns and the railways bypassed the town centre. What we actually have in Wimbledon is a total opposite. We've actually got trains to fly, and then the town centre happened around that. And what happened quite early on in modern times is that the suburban streets began to get built before the town centre and actually happens. And what we now find is this juxtaposition of commercial town centre buildings right in the back gardens of Victorian houses. It's an odd juxtaposition, but it exists and it always has. Um, as a time like this through Wimbledon, there's a few absolute horrors of stuff happening in the 70s and 80s. And uh, no town in Britain is unique from that. Um, but what we found is Wimbledon has always gone through this period of recycling itself. A lot of the 70s and 80s buildings we see now, 60s, 70s, we thought they were bomb damage, because normally they are. And Wimbledon they were. Just somebody decided to knock down nice buildings and put up the ones back. So it's, Wimbledon's got a history of self-regenerating itself. <laughs> Similarly, the train station, the 1910s train station, got replaced in the 30s. The beautiful town hall up there from the 1800s got replaced in the 30s. Wimbledon's always recycled itself because it can't grow out. And that recycling's always happened every time a huge change in transport happens. So it's when the trains extended, it's when the Croydon line came in, when the tram line happened. And I think with Crossrail too, I know it's caused a lot of anxiety and worry, but that kind of next iteration of Wimbledon because of transport is a historic thing, and Wimbledon and Crossrail will do the same. This plan is not a plan for how we fit Crossrail into Wimbledon. This is us setting our stall out for the quality aspirations we want for the town centre, for which we expect Crossrail and everything else to fit in. <clears throat> this doesn't work on the screen, so I mean, I'm not to dwell on it too much. In effect, this summarises the master plan process we've gone through. We, this structure is based on a Danish urbanist, Jan Gale, who I'm a huge fan of. And what he proposes is when you plan towns and cities, it's not all about the buildings and how they look. That's just the backdrop. Really successful places is where the public space feels good, where the streets feel comfortable, and there's a human scale, and there's an activity. So to give an example of that, if you walk down Wimbledon Hill Road, it's quite nice. It's good little shops all down it. It actually does it four or five stories above. You don't see that, because you're seeing white screen. Us as humans can see white screen. You experience the street, you don't look up. If you walk down Hartford Road, you walk down the back end of Morrison's, it's Garrett's, fire exit doors, it's black walls, it's rubbish. So instantly we know what makes a good place and what doesn't. And the master plan picks up on that as a human experience. We do have to talk about buildings, and we do. But for me it's about the puppets, the people, the public spaces, and then the buildings. And we design the master plan in that format. This has all gone through workshops with you guys, many of you are there, recognised spaces. Uh, we're now at the, the concept design stage of the master plan. And so what we're going to do next week is have it online. Uh, it's just totally open to comment. We're not doing questionnaires. We're just saying, we think this is what you told us. We'll no feedback. And then we'll turn it into planning policy next year. <coughs> this is a very old picture. Um, so out of the workshops, I think I've shown this before, but I'll reiterate it. <coughs> In the workshops, we actually ask people to put a point on a map, what you like and what you not like. About them. Green stickers meant people liked it, red stickers people hated it. We have 94 maps out of those workshops, and when we collate all that information together, we have a pattern of Wimbledon where there's not a lot of green. <coughs> the green tends to be the conservation areas, the listed buildings, naturally. Um, the red tends to be <coughs> swar, and the amber, folk are better than about it. Now, when we talk about places and planning, because I have to look long term to the future, it is a bit of a bit of optimism in how things might change. We've got a town centre here where most residents have said they don't like it. And that's really odd. Um, from, from that, we can pick out what people like. It's about the human scale, um, some of the streets, some of the spaces. What people don't like, clearly, is actually probably what was described earlier through planning. There's a lot of stuff that becomes mediocre because it gets, kind of gets designed by a committee because everyone's involved. And that waters, that waters down that good architecture. 
that John's death and done. Um, so what we found out from the workshops is people do have an appetite for boldness. People do have an appetite for maybe taller buildings if they're well designed. What we've never got to grips with is what to speak about to the like. Not that we know what that is like. So we've had to go to. So just to iterate, the master plan area is generally the town centre. It doesn't touch residential streets at all. It's all the commercial town centre. So that's from Master Road, Wimbledon Hill Road, through to Merton Road. Uh, and we've also included the train tracks from Gap Road, uh, Gap Road down to Dundonald Gardens. And that's because this plan works towards 2040. And Wimbledon does have to grow. We're managing growth now, we're getting planning applications all the time. There's strong investor confidence here, and that change is managed. But once that happens, what next? Do we rock it skywards like other town centres, or actually do we look at the air that isn't built on yet and focus the building there? So over the tracks is going to be a key move. And that's our strategy for growth. So if you know where we now, it's a linear town centre. It's practically a one street town. A very busy one street town, half of our jobs are in there. Uh, so it's a very productive, popular place. Looking ahead 15, 20 years, we think the growth will actually be north south. And what that does is change the dynamics of the town centre. Instead of being a linear, it becomes like a cross. And the station area kind of becomes the heart of that new town. So this is our proposed strategy. Apologies for the presentation, the slides is not clever, but um, all of this will be available to you online. What we've actually proposed here, this is the proposed building blocks for a new building. And what the plan proposes is where development might happen, what size and form it might happen. It does not design the buildings. No council in the world designs the buildings or less for the council. But what we have to do is allow the freedom of architects to come forward with quality design. But we use this as a framework to shape it. And to some extent, if we are agree, agreed on the layout and height and size of things, we can deal with that with developers quickly and focus on getting quality right. So what the plan proposes here is there is a historic core to Wimbledon, which is the Broadway. Uh, which we're not proposing really to change too much through the, um, at the top end and the middle end of Queen's Road. That's where your Victorian terraces are, and actually we've just completed a project to restore the Queen's Road curve using developers' money. So we get the value of heritage. <coughs> this isn't about flattening everything. What this does do is flatten a lot of the buildings you essentially don't like. And actually, a lot of them from the 70s and 80s, the leases are coming to an end, the owners do want to reinvest in it. But what developers want is certainty. And I don't think they do get that at the moment from our planning service, from us as a community. Um, so, what this plan does is try to put something out there which people can respond to. Longer term, we're looking at if we develop all the tracks, what that does is begin to stitch the movement together. I don't want to say back together because it's always been split by the railway. But what you can actually begin to see there is the existing streets, just off the woodside, can come right across. The railway. Same down in Dundonald Yards as existing streets down in Dundonald's. Well, we can just extend the streets there, that's still good quality neighbourhoods. But these are new neighbourhoods for 20 days. Not everything will happen that quickly. This is long term stuff. Um, fundamentally, <coughs> what, one of the key changes there is we've got a lot of, a lot of the kind of ugly blocks, we call it, is around St George's Road. <coughs> and we're getting developer interest then already. And you can see these kind of square, perfectly square <laughs> blocks. These blocks currently are huge, and what we're proposing is a network of streets and laneways between them. Because that's where you get your small scale experience. Now forget building height for a minute. When you're in laneways, that's where you get the small scale shops, the human interaction. So think bright lanes. Um, and that's what these blocks can do if we plan it right with those owners. And that sets up a whole new typology of streets for Wimbledon. So if Wimbledon's going to get busier, because more people are working here and more people are visiting, you need more public space, you need more streets to walk around, you need more plazas, pocket parks, all of that. All we've got at the moment is the Broadway and the Piazza, and it just isn't enough for a town that's famous as well. So the plan shows a layout. We've also offered advice on high and massive. I'm sure that will be controversial one way or another, but we're putting it out there anyway. Uh, because we, the council thinks that's a good, what we're going to show for heights. It's a decent enough balance between probably what people want and what developers want, and the truth is always somewhere in the middle. 
But when we're talking about recycling existing buildings, you do have to get enough capital value out of redevelopment, otherwise it just doesn't work. And I think sticking with the town we've got now is a good enough. So I think we do have to accept a level of growth. We propose that for the moment. Um, and not only growth. I'll come back to the 3D image in a minute, that's the last bit. We have helpfully through all the workshops pinned down what we mean because good, what's good about the terms of design. And I'll just take two minutes here then we'll open to questions. People keep asking what's my woman's character? What's his DNA? And up until the kind of post-war 60s architectural era, it was quite well defined in Wimbledon. All your very important city buildings were white Portland stone or limestone. So that's you know, this is your town. It's the regional churches, the town hall, the station. So your big important buildings were white. Next step down, your other civic buildings, the library, the police station, the old fire station, the theatre, the bank buildings, they're very bright and terracotta. And then you move further down, the most normal other buildings were yellow London stock brick with a bit of white detail. Now that's not entirely uncommon across London, but that defined pattern is quite fixed for women, and that pattern has just been eroded through time. Now, I'm not suggesting we revert back to some Victorian and theme park. It's not made to be Disneyland. But I've picked examples of elsewhere in London and some of them where you can still pick up this DNA and do it in a contemporary way so you still get the feeling it feels women again. I think we've just lost too much of that. So the examples here, that the white curve one, that's Finsbury Suffolk, that's just been built because of Crossroad 1. Uh, it sits in a multi Victorian grand terrace. But because you use good materials and the proportions are right, it's still contemporary. It's a cracking office in real time. The one down the bottom is on Old Bitch and Strand. That's Bartley Holmes, which has done eight stories of flats in there. They've cleverly hidden two stories in the roof and done that Parisian style roof. And I think what a lot we see in planning is just flat roof buildings, because people are frightened of height. Whereas in actual fact, if you get things a roof steep, it makes the town more interesting. And you get more development behind it. Uh, so, Wellington House, I think one of the rappers caught that would be quite pleased with that one, on Madison Road. Um, and then, stage three is kind of yellow, brick and green, green glazed tiles. Again, quite one of the way think of green. So, there is ways of doing it. I just don't think we ask the right questions. I don't know what the public think of all of this. Therefore, I'm not confident enough to have this fight with a developer. But once this consultation has happened and we get your feedback, me and other planning team will be happy to tell developers this is how we want to. So the consultation is totally open for you to tell us what you think. That is scary about the building There we go. <clears throat> so what we're proposing in terms of the tall building strategy, and I should say this is supplementary to our existing tall building policy, which says we'll build up tall air buildings around St George's Roads and around the YMCA. And sorry, the YMCA is cut off the map because we're still drawing this for next week. Now, when everyone talks about tall buildings, and I've heard it umpteen times at the community forum, people keep buying out of a coin, and they don't want to build into the I'm fed up hearing that. It's not nice that we criticise a neighbouring town. No one's ever suggested one of the goes like coin. This level of growth, we are talking around St George's Road, 8, 10, and then 12, 14 storeys on top of the train line. These are not towers, these are just big buildings. If you go to Barcelona, and walk down the streets there, you don't think it's full of towers because those square Barcelona blocks are six, seven, eight stories tall. There's also a study done in an unknown by the building heights. The study uh, by the New London Architecture Centre has looked at there's 500 odd tall buildings with planning permission allowed to be built in London. So, if you could just point out where is the station? The station there. That's the station. That's the Old Town Hall with the glass bit behind so the bridge. Where's the Broadway? Yeah. Where's the YMCA? Horizontal. Oh, so um, Town Hall, Theatre, YMCA should be here. I'll be happy to go there. So, how tall is the station? I'll come back to that question in a minute about how tall the station is. So, sorry, where are all those really tall buildings? I can't quite get them there. The right, shall I? I'll point to the map, it'll be easier. Come on, we've got that. Well, 10 minutes, so I'll wrap up and take questions. <clears throat> so, so the bits you'll recognise now which haven't changed. You've got the Rotunda, the Town Hall, the old pub, um, Prince of Wales. Yeah. <clears throat> then 
This doesn't exist yet because it's air above the tracks. Nothing's built here yet. This is above the train line. So what you've got now is Wimbledon Bridge House in the car park. We know Crossrail in the last consultation said they might have to get rid of that anyway. So what we said is, well, if they had to get rid of Wimbledon Bridge House, make a new town square at the heart of the town. So you have Plaza Minor, if you're in Madrid. Um, and above the tracks, we're saying, put the taller buildings here. We're not in people's back gardens here. This is just commercial buildings based on commercial buildings. It's the least sensitive part of town to put them. <coughs> so this scale of development, we think is appropriate for a scale of growth for Wimbledon. And this is 2030s. And it's quite a way <coughs> Um, I talked about tall buildings, there's 500 on the, um, with Planning Commission in London now. Um, example, Croydon, they're doing 30 and 60 storeys, I'm proposing 14 and 60 <coughs> max. So we think we're pitching this at a right level. I know you'll have reviews on this and other bits. All I'll say is the document's 120 pages, it's huge. Um, take the time to read it and digest it. The consultation's going to run for two months because it needs that. And me and my team are happy to come and talk to you in detail. I'm sorry I can't do it justice here tonight, but we can. And just finally, in terms of engagement, <clears throat> I did mention I care about public spaces as well as buildings. We are teaming up with a Spanish architect in practice who won a competition a while back. Um, and they won a competition where the prize was play Wimbledon. And basically, what they recognise is streets are something to be enjoyed. So why do we have some fun in them? So we're proposing to do some pop-up seating and pop-up events around the town centre. And it's to test out how new public spaces might work. So if you know the area outside the theatre, there's a double road at the theatre. We don't need two roads. And we closed one off temporarily at Christmas last year to see the work, and it was fine. So what we want to do is actually make a proper pedestrian space there. So we're going to do pop-up, well, I say pop-up, it's like plywood seats, all temporary stuff. And that's so we can test whether how people use the space. Is it popular? And what it means is we've not spent millions of pounds on granite. We've actually tried it out cheap first to test it. And then if people like it or will adapt it, then we'll do it properly. And we use developers' money from that all that development to come over. So and also the other space is just out here, it's a March place. <coughs> it's a bit forlorn at the moment because the trees died. It's a bit of a, it could be better. The art space could space follow it into it. So we're going to do a public space workshop, which you're all welcome to, where we're going to actually go on the street and design our streets um, and get your input on that. So this isn't about all big buildings in the future. I really care about how making the spaces we've got now better. And we've got bits of money already to start doing that. So we've got public space workshops happening soon. Keep an eye on the website. And then the master plan doc will be online from Monday. Um, so I'll and what we're going to do is keep that consultation in <coughs> December. My team will then collate all that information and feedback, and we hope to report back to Cabinet in January for agreement. After that point, the plan applications committee can start using the plan to inform their decisions. Yeah. Any questions? And just four, four, four questions. <coughs> so, Paul, thank you very much. So, can you just tell us? So, so can you just remind us where, where all this information will be available? Yep, so first and foremost, uh, the council's website, Merton slash Future Wimbledon. Um, if not Friday, certainly Monday, I'll get the documents on the website and you can check it there. Uh, the public space workshops, we will advertise it on there and on the council's Twitter, but um, I don't have a date yet, it'll be sometime in October. Okay, so, so with your permission, what I suggest we do is, is uh, just have three second conversation with Paul. Um, he has agreed that either he or one of his team will come back to the December meeting. So my suggestion, uh, we can take one or two questions tonight, but my suggestion is that you look at the uh, website, digest the information. We've heard a lot tonight, so it's new to nearly all of us, it was new to me. So we digest this information. Please, I would encourage you to attend the workshops. Paul has agreed that he or one of his team will come back to the December 4th meeting. My undertaking to you is that we will have whatever time we need to get to every question and every comment on that occasion. Uh, and Paul has agreed that can then go into the consultation process. My suggestion, we have literally, I'll, I'll take one question from you, sir, but my, my, my suggestion is we have literally five minutes 
What I'd like to do is wind up now and uh, ask for one question from, from, from the gentleman at the back who's very keen to speak, uh, and then you can have five minutes to, 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 to speak to Paul, to speak to Stephen, but the promise is that we will have a thorough and proper debate when we meet at the beginning of December. So, so one question from you, sir, that I'm going to wind up. How are we going to engage, because you, you've got to think the title of the Schools um, as part of their job and curriculum. Um, we have been asked to engage digitally. Um, I don't yet know how really we're going to do that because kind of, we just don't have time to spend all day on social media. Um, but I will work with the council's calls to get more out digitally. Um, we are also going to do street stencils, so just to catch people's imagination, the website Spray in the Street is temporary or way off. Uh, but we do need to do a bit more than just say it's on the council website and attend one meet each other. Can we get that. some banners in the town to advertise it? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a real opportunity to get and, one. And to fair, that's why I'm getting that a good two months. I mean, there's no real time number, but people are longer. Um, but I think it is an important topic, so we need a lot of people's input. Uh, so, yeah, I get the point. Thank you. Very, very, very quickly. You say about the tall buildings like the House of George's Road now, and you mentioned it in the same context as Barcelona. So does that mean the walkways that and everything that you're saying about putting in between them will be wide like in Barcelona? Because yeah. that makes you've got tall buildings, it makes it very hard. Uh, yeah, so, it, so that's about the block structures. They're not dated to Barcelona, <coughs> I wish. Um, yeah, I mean, if it's new streets, you can have lay ways quite close. If you go to City Hall in London, uh, there's the route to City Hall. The buildings are big and close, but yeah, you don't want dark streets everywhere. Exactly, because you walk around places now with these little buildings and all that. We need to find a balance of it. We need to find a balance of the old street structure and then the new ones mm -hmm. to do it different kinds of it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's called class. And one of the reasons we have to be so strict, just so you know, is that wherever we are, obviously something has to be here. Uh, so we have to lock up and turn out the light. So that's why we have to uh, be there. Um, can I ask?